Okay, let me see. Okay, so my notes are already, um, let me see, okay, good. Someone already put the start there. I'm gonna hide this, uh, hide, watching the controls, okay. So my notes are already in the GitHub repo in case anyone wants to um, download those. So I'm gonna go over chapter six from the book, which talks about data cubes. It's a rather um, small chapter. It's not really that long, um, but it has crucial information about data cubes or um, seeing spatial data that's not necessarily two dimensional. Um, it didn't contain any learning objectives, so I didn't feel like, you know, creating some here, but basically what we're gonna see is what is a data cube, what its attributes are, some examples, and how a little bit of how you can work with them, right? Because not necessarily you're gonna need all the information that is in the data cube. Sometimes you're gonna to want to just either summarize it or aggregate it. So how, how would that work? Um, the best way I have seen this is a graph that I uh, that I got from the internet, but this is exactly what a data cube is. So essentially you're gonna have, um, when we're talking about spatial data cubes, right? You're gonna have your coordinates, your X and Y coordinates, and then you're gonna have a third dimension or even more, right? You can have a hypercube, which would have more than just three. You could have four here, five, six dimensions. But if you if we have here our third dimension that it's gonna be time for this example, so what would what we would be seeing is for for one data point that we are plotting in space, right? In, you, using x and y coordinates, then you would have a third dimension which would be in this case time, and you would have not just that x and y value, but you would have values that change for that space point that would change over time. And that would give you a pattern seen here uh, represented with bars, with bar with these bar graphs. And you can have that for all the data points that you have on X and Y. And in this case, you have multiple points, but you could also have this um, for each spatial point here in space, not necessarily just these ones that are selected. You can have them for each um, uh, value of, the, of a matrix here, which could have like a resolution of, let's say 10 by 10 kilometers. And for each one of those 10 by 10 kilometers uh, squares that you have here on X and Y, you have a value associated in time. What is represented on each, cell or for each one of those values can vary. In this case, it could be, for example, um, forest cover, so the percentage of forest cover for that, for that one single point and how that varies across time. So you would have the same um, value, in this case, forest cover, and then recorded at different time, uh, time points, right? That could be whatever value, whatever variable that you have, but you would, you just have it set to vary across, in this case, the third dimension, uh, which is time. So that's essentially what a data cube is. Um, but let's go over it through the chapters or through the chapter. So the way they define a four-dimensional data cube is by starting with a three-dimensional data cube, which is the easiest way to see it, right? So we usually, usually we have, um, we see the world in three space dimensions, which would be um, length, depth, and height. That's exactly how we see the world. But we can add a fourth dimension, which usually is time. And then we can see how things are moving or changing like that. Essentially, data cubes are arrays. Like we're used to seeing data in R in arrays. And that's, if I go to my 
Zoom settings. Oh my gosh, how can I? Let me just check this. Wait a second. Did I close it? Am I not in Zoom anymore? Wait, what? Wait, 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 wait. What am I doing here? Now, there we go. There we go. Okay, so annotate. Draw. Where am I here? Let's go back to the book. Where is that? I think. Oh my gosh, you guys, I'm so sorry. I'm having some. Uh, let's close this. Let's go back here. Ah, okay. And then let's close it here. I'm so sorry. <laughs> having some. Ah, there we go. I hate it when when I when this thing disappears and then I cannot find it anymore. But anyway, going back to what I was saying. Um, so data cubes are arrays, and that's what we're usually um like used to seeing or when we work in R. If we have just one vector, that's gonna be just one column, right? Let's call it column one. And then we can have multiple columns, column two, column three. And then we will have row one and then row two. And this becomes a data frame, right? So then we have two dimensions here. If we add a third one, which would be, let's repeat this data frame again here, the same structure. So this would be, um, let's call it dimension one. And then we would have a second dimension here and then a third one. Then we have an array, right? Which is exactly represented as that. It's a data frame with the same structure repeated over time. That's an array. And I, I think at least if you have some experience with R, that's what we're used to seeing that. So that's what it represents here when they say that it's an array. But you can have an array, a spatial array too, right? Which would be in this case, like represented here, which the most common one is like I mentioned, um, a spatial temporal data cube. That's like the most common one when the third dimension becomes time, but you can add as many more dimensions as you, as you want. And then you would only um, choose, you can choose what to represent in R. It would be just the longitude and the latitude. Then you only have the two dimensions from your hypercube. But if you choose to represent the longitude, latitude, and the time, then you have this three-dimensional cube. But then let's say you are not interested in, in seeing that time, but another dimension that you have here, so it would be like the longitude, the latitude, and height, for example, then you switch that time for the, for the other dimension that you want to see. Obviously, we are just limited of, or in three dimensions, which is what we can see in, in um in R, right? But essentially you can have as many as you want and that becomes a hypercube or, or a hyper rectangle. But essentially that's, you know, rare to have, but know that it, it can happen, right? An example of a, of a data cube is, for example, when we have um, color images, when you have um, modis images, for example, satellite imagery that has uh, colored bands, usually blue, green, and red. And we have a fourth one that can be the near infrared too. So then that can become a four-dimensional cube because you would have time, latitude, longitude, and then the, um, the, the bands, right? That would become your fourth dimension. And then you can choose to represent that, like I said, in two dimensions, one dimension even, <clears throat> or three or or um, not necessarily all four at, at one time. So here we have this hypercube. We are representing it in just two dimensions, which would be time on your y-axis. Let me put that here. So then this would be time. And then on your 
x axis, what you have are the bands. So that's just representing two of the four dimensions that you have. Okay. There, oh, let me remove that. Clear on drawings. Okay. Then the other, um, the next section talks about the dimensions, the attributes, and the support that you have when dealing with data set, with uh, spatial cubes. So depending on the data that we're dealing with, the data can be discrete or can be continuous. You can even have categorical data uh, in, uh, embedded here. And then you may have the following data structure. So you can have, for example, time series, which is like you said, like we saw before, right? Something that is changing across time. You can have a raster image. You can have time sequences of uh, images. So it would be like a dynamic spatial data. Like we were talking about like the spatial temporal uh, arrays or data cubes. So the way they are representing this, like the equation that they are using to represent this is that you are gonna have a variable Z that's gonna depend on X, Y, and T. In this case, that's, those are your coordinates. X, Y, and T could be time, for example. So that, those are the cube dimensions. Um, and then if we have multiple time dimensions, then we represent each one like so. Instead of using just the F, X, Y, T notation, so meaning that the variable that you have, in this case, Z, uh, is a function of x, y, t. Now what you have is represented as all of those dimensions. If you only have three dimensions, then it would be d1, d2, and d3. Uh, when we're splitting time in years, for example, then you have whatever variable you have of interest represented for year one, year two, all the way up to year n, right? We deal with data sets with one or more space dimensions and zero or more time dimensions as data cubes. So usually we are dealing with this hypercube and all of these variables combined that obviously we have to re re um, work with it, right? We, we cannot see the hypercube or the all of those dimensions. So we have to sort of, um, Simplify it in order to work with it. Um, the some of the examples of the um, data sets that we can uh, be dealing with are simple features, for example, uh, which are just like points or lines or a polygon. We can have time series for sets of features. Um, we can have a raster data. We can have multi-spectral raster data images, which are satellite imagery that we were talking about, like the MODIS data. Or we could have video, which is something that's varying, not just um, multi-spectrally, but in, in time too, right? I have no idea how you would work with that because I've never done that, but um, you know, so complicated things. Anyone has any comments up till now? No, oh, it's okay. Good. Okay, so um, so these are examples of what can be uh, contained in that hypercube, right? Okay. So what do we do, or what type of operations we can have with these? Yeah, like like Landsat imagery, exactly. So if we go, I think you can see my screen here, right? So if we see oh, Landsat imagery. So here, what do we have? Um, let me see, but if we go to the gallery, maybe we have something here. Yeah, like this, for example. This is a zoom uh, of, of an area. I don't even know what area that is, right? But you would have these, um, this Landsat image 
that is going to have your X and Y coordinates, but it's also going to contain information on the bands that you're going to that you're going to have here. So that would be your third dimension. And if you have Landsat for week one, week two, week three, week four, for example, for a month, then you're adding a four dimension, which would be, which would be um, it would be like the same structure, but varying across time. And the bands are just telling you um, the, um, the information in ones and zeros contained in that image. So for a band red, blue, um, green, and then the infrared. And then that essentially, after a little bit of tweaking, you end up with something like this, right? Like something that is what we are used to seeing um, with our own eyes, right? But what we obtain from the satellite is these ones and zeros from that. So that's, a, that's an example of a data cube, for example. Um, so the operations that we can do with these data cubes, which is with satellite imagery, or if you only have like, for example, um, forest cover, and you have the coordinates of, 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 um, of forest cover for a series of points on a, on a, on a, on a forest, on an area or, or somewhere like that. Then what you want to do with that with that data set with that data cube is the first one that you might think about is like I said, sort of making it easier for you to just see whatever it is that you want to see instead of having that hypercube or that cube of information. Right? It's too much. So then let's just focus on what it is that we want to see, and that is slicing a cube. That's what, what they call slicing a cube, which essentially is just filtering. How does that look like? Um, it's essentially fixing one of the dimensions at a particular value, and then just seeing that little portion of things that you are slicing. So if we go to our example here, we are just seeing, um, let's say if this was like one of the other images that I showed you, right? Like one of those rasters. So you're gonna have a raster here. Um, if this is a Landsat image, okay, I need this. So, um, and you're gonna have just the information that you have across time. So each row is gonna represent um, X, Y, right? So first column here, it's gonna be your latitude. That's gonna be your, yeah, latitude. And then this is gonna be your longitude. And what you have here is the first raster is going to be for this date. And then the second raster is going to be corresponding with this other date. But what's varying across the blue one and the green one is that the blue one is going to have um, the information from the, from the blue, um, only the reflectance from the blue um, band the green one, the red one, and then the infrared, right? So then that is, that's a lot of information. That's like sometimes, not that it's complicated, but you don't necessarily need to represent it like that. So what you do then, let me just clear all of this. So then what you do is you do this slicing, or then you're focused on something that you wanna see from this. So for example, if you filter it temporally, then that means that you're gonna, where is my? Here, so if you filter it temporally, then you're just focused on one specific time. And then that's what you end up representing. You fix that time. It could be that you're just fixing one date. So in this case, it would be October 25th. And then, you keep all the rest of the covariates, but you're only interested in that specific date. The other thing that you can do is just filter by bands. I'm not interested in all of them. I just wanna see the information from the infrared. So you, it's not that you discard the rest, right? It's just that you're just filtering that portion because you're interested in only the information that that band is providing for you 
And then the rest is that you have your X, Y coordinates, you have your time, right? Your latitude, your longitude. You have, these things are varying in time, but you're only interested in that specific band. The other thing that you can do is filter spatially. And then what you have is you are only interested in a certain portion of whatever it is that it's inside your raster. So let's say that this right here is, for example, um, an urban center that you're interested in. The rest may have forest and the, the rest that is here, right? This could be forest. This could be a river. You're not interested in that. You're only interested in seeing this little portion which contains that urban center that you're interested in. So that's what you're filtering spatially. Spatially means that you're gonna set these coordinates or these coordinates for this polygon, right? And then that's what's gonna give you just that little slice across time and for all the bands, but just filtering for that specific area because that's what you're interested in. Or that could be a river or that could be a lake or something like that that you're interested in. Um, so that's the first thing that you can, that you might be interested in doing. So you can filter it in order to just not have that, um, all that information, right? That it's in, in your queue. You're just interested in a little, in a little uh, portion of what is there. Oh, let me see if I didn't um, miss something here. Oh, yes. So then the other thing that you might be interesting, interested in doing is applying functions to some of the dimensions that you're dealing with. Functions such as, um, Apps, which is um, the absolute value of the data that you have. You might be interested in doing something like square root of whatever value it is that you have. And you might be interested in applying it to all the values in, in your cube. So that would mean that for every one of the little points that you have here, right, for the raster, that every one of the, of the points is going to get you're going to whatever value is in there. For example, if it's forest cover, um, if you have density, uh, population density, if you whatever it is that you have there, you're going to apply a function to all of those values. So if, for example, you started with here. So if your raster contained, this is just one of them, right? So if your raster, let's say this was percentage of forest cover. So if you started with, let's say 30, 20, 10, 10, 10, 10, 20, and then you have here 20, 20, 20. And then you say, okay, so I'm gonna apply a function to all of these values. If I do square root, or if I do like um, give me, each one of those values elevated to the um, power of two. And then that's what you do. Square root, square root, square root, square root of each one of them. And then that will, that will then become, obviously, another raster with the values of that square root of 30, which I have no idea what it is. So then you, that's the value that you would have here. And then square root of 20 here, et cetera, et cetera. Clear my drawings here. Okay, so that's um, that's one of the things that you might be interested in doing. Depends obviously on whatever it is that you're working with. The other thing that you might be interesting interested in doing is I I called it summarizing functions. I really don't know what else to call them. So I put that's like my own um, my own definition, if you will. But you can apply functions like mean, for example, or standard deviation, something that you're going to do to the entire cube, but it's going to return only one single value. So it's not going to return the same raster that you were working with. So for example, if we have here, um, so if we have the same raster and you, it had values like 10, let's say 10, 10, 20, 10, 10, 10, 20, and then here 20, and you apply a mean to the entire cube, 
what you're going to end up with is not going to be a raster. It's just going to be a value. And let's say, I'm just going to make something up. Let's say the average of that value, it's 15. So then you end up with, if this was forest cover, percentage of forest cover, then you end up with the mean of that value. If this was, for example, um, population density, if this was whatever it is, you can apply standard deviation, the mean, you can summarize all the information that you have contained in that raster and then return only one value or a series of values, right? Because if you're doing mean, standard deviation or something like that, for all of the information contained in this, um, in this raster. And you can do that too for the entire cube. So you can say, for example, give me the mean. So if you have here, um, so this would be week one, and then you have the same thing, but for week two, and then give me week three and week four, and then give me the mean for all the values across time. So then you would end up with the mean of whatever information you have here for us to cover for that month, for example. So you can do that for the entire cube or just for a raster. That depends on, again, what you're working with or what you are interested in, in representing or working with. But you can, you can certainly do that. The idea is to, um, sometimes is to reduce dimensions because you, like I said, you, you're starting with this gigantic amount of information, but you're not interested in that, right? You are you want to reduce it or you want to um, summarize it or aggregate it in a way so that it can answer the questions that you have or that you can work through them more easily, right? Because there's gonna be a lot of things there that you're not necessarily interested in. So when reducing dimensions, or when you're interested in that, in reducing dimensions of the massive amount of data that you have, is what, exam uh, an example is like what I was talking about before, right? When you're applying a function like the mean, then the, the cube reduces its dimensionality to zero. So you start with a four dimension cube or a three dimensional cube, and then you end up with, just one value, like the mean of all of, all of all the values that you have contained in that raster or, or in that cube. So then instead of having that three dimensional cube, you end up with just one value or three values or two, depending on how many functions you're applying there, right? The following example that they put here in the book uh, shows estimated the NDVI. I don't know if everyone is familiar with what the NDVI is um, can you can you let me know? Okay, well, essentially, NDVI what it represents is um, you are yeah exactly. So it's the normalized difference vegetation index. So it's this is an index. There are many indexes. This is just one. And what it's representing is the proportion of green or greenness that you have in an area. So because vegetation is green, <laughs> um, that's why it's called normalized. Uh, vegetation index. Anyway, this is a whole complicated thing because there are several indexes that are um, that are used to that are used to um, help you represent or understand how much greenery you have in an area. And essentially what you do is you start with a satellite image. And because it's going to contain all the bands right that you have here, then you're going to work through them in order to end up with just one number. Because what you're interested in is that those green values, right? How much greener you have in a certain area. So that, let me clear all of this. Okay, so then you start with, um, and you now have rasters. I mean, you can do this by hand and starting with a satellite image or a series of satellite images. And then you can 
calculate the NDVI. There are thousands of tutorials on how to do that. But there are also rasters now that give you the NDVI already estimated, right? Because it's 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 rather not it's not that complicated. But anyway, so what you end up doing with oh sorry, I have something here. Yes, so it's the um, it, yeah, like I said, how much green you have in an area, right? It's like the the proportion of of, of greenery that you have in 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 an area. Anyway. So what you can do is, so you have all your bands here, right? So you're gonna have the green, the blue, the red, and the infrared. And then you may be interested in, like um, like we saw before, reducing that temporally, because maybe you're not interested in all the four weeks that you have in that month. Maybe you're interested in either just one week or summarizing them so that you can have just one value for that month. Most of the times, well, not most of the times, all of the time, what you end up with is that when you have one of these um, satellite imageries, images, they are estimated across, um, or they're, they are collected across um, like every five weeks, every six weeks, There's like, time varies, right? So then what you end up with is if you have one every, every week, like, you have one for, this is gonna be like the Monday, the first Monday of a month, the second Monday of, a, of the month, third Monday of the month, and the fourth Monday of the month, you can then summarize that for just giving you, okay, so then I'm just interested in seeing this, not for each week, but for the entire month. Let's summarize that, right? And then you are just end up, instead of having four, different cubes or for four, um, having a third dimension here, which would be time in your hypercube, then you are just dealing now with X, Y for all your bands. Instead of having time as a third, as a fourth dimension, you're not interested in that one anymore. So then you only have your bands, your X and your Y. The other thing that you might be interested in is maybe you're not interested in all of the bands. So you can either combine them or just select one of them. So you end up with three dimensions instead of four, right? Instead of having time bands X and Y, you reduce it by either working, combining all of the four um, bands together or just selecting one of them. Maybe the infrared is the one that you're interested in. So then you have time, so it varies by time, and then you have your X's and your Y's. And then um, this one is reducing spatially. Ah, okay, so here what you have is instead of having um, X and Y as a, as a, as a fourth, um, as a as another dimension, what you're doing is maybe you're interested in saying, okay, so if I have here for the first one, like if this area right here, the first, um, where's my pencil? Wait a second. Okay, so for this one, I'm not interested in all the um, the different points that I have. If the resolution is like let's say ten by ten kilometers. Each one of those um, little squares that you see in here is a 10 by 10 kilometer. I'm just making something up, right? It could be one by one meter, et cetera. Maybe you're not interested in the value for each one of those points. You're interested in how much this entire area, if we're talking about NDVI, right? What's the value for the entire area? And then you end up with this value for that one. that's 40 that's averaging all of well you can do um, standard deviation the median um, you can do whatever summarizing function that you want right but essentially what it is is that you're reducing it spatially because you're not interested in essentially each one of these data points you're just interested in the whole area right the value of ndvi for the whole area but you're interested in seeing this 
for each one of the bands and across time. It could be that you even reduce, not just spatially, but spatially and temporally. So you're just interested in the bands or um, so you can summarize it in, in more than one dim dimension, I guess that's what I'm trying to say here. Another thing that you can do with your, um, with your cubes is something that they refer to as aggregating. And this was, like I, like I mentioned in another one of, the, of our sessions, I am I'm not that advanced in spatial analysis, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm really level one, I would say, <laughs> level one, level two of 10. Um, but something that I was always, um, that I never really, it never really clicked on me for like a long time. And, I, I, and if I'm mistaken, please correct me, but every time you're thinking about reducing, so making it something that's three-dimensional, right? Making it um, in a more simple way, you're trying to reduce it. You're gonna see this, uh, this um, verb called aggregate. And that's key because I, I kept seeing the verb aggregate and I was like just ignoring it and I, and I didn't really pay attention. But then one day it just sort of clicked and I'm like, of course, because you're reducing, you're aggregating some of those pixels into um, like um, into one single value, for example. So this aggregating verb, I guess, I don't know. When it clicked, it clicked, I suppose. Anyway, so you can start with a four-dimensional data cube and then aggregate it to a three-dimensional vector data cube. So then it's like that. That's why I put reduce here because it's like you're, you're simplifying it in a way so that you can only see the information that you're interested in, not the whole thing. So when you have um, pixels in this raster, for example, you're going to see that they are, um, so let's see example here first. So you're going to have your first dimension, which is going to be time. So that's going to be each, um, let me go here. So you're going to have time. So you're going to have um, your first week, your second week, your third week, right? So that's what each one of these is varying in. And then you have, again, your bands and your latitude and longitude values. So then you may be interested in grouping them by geometry. What that means is that you're interested in only the information that is inside this polygon, for example, or contained within this line. And that's the only thing that you're interested in across all of your dates, right? So then what you do is then you group it by geometry. So you say, okay, so just give me the information that's gonna be in this polygon and in this line. That's what you see here, um, here in that part. For all of your bands and across time, or you can say just for the first week, and then reduce it to a vector cube, which that would mean essentially an array, right? So you're gonna have all your bands here, your blue, your green, your red, or your near infrared. And then you're gonna have your first for your line. So that would be for this one. And then for your polygon, which would be this one. And then these are the values that are contained. So for, the, for, the, for this one, for this line, you're aggregating all the values that are in that line across all of these pixels. Let's say there are 10 pixels there. So you're just aggregating it by the mean, for example. And then that's the value that you have for the blue line. And then for the green band, you do exactly the same. So you have 10 pixels here, for example, and then let's average it 209. That's gonna be the average of all the values that you have, or you're gonna sum them, or you can standard deviation, whatever it is that you wanna do with them. And then the same thing for the polygon. Give me all the, um, for all the pixels that are contained within this, um, polygon, give me the mean of all those values. And then that's what you have. And then because it's varying across time, then you have, um, that's where the array comes in, right? Like that's your third dimension. 
So then you're reducing, you're aggregating, that's what the aggregating um, comes from. You're aggregating all the values that are contained in this, um, in this portion of your raster. You're aggregating those, those pixels into one value. So that's something else that you might be interested in. And then you can represent that in, a, in an array, or maybe you're just interested in one week, and then you, you would only have one data frame, right? Instead of having all of this time here, then you, you would only end up with one data frame. And, oh, wait, let me see if that was the end of that one. Oh, yeah, okay, so examples of vector data cubes are, for example, air quality data, when you have like um, parts per million or um, these microparticles that are 10 or less over two dimensions as a sequence of monitoring stations or time intervals. So then you would have, um, so if you have here, for example, this is your raster. And then you have your stations are gonna be, so here's one station, here's another station, here's another station. Um, and then you have, this is gonna be for your first day, so day one. And then you have the same information, but for day two. And then you have the same station. You have one here, one here, and the other one is hidden in the back. So then what you do is you aggregate because you're not interested in all of the days, just a summary or an, um, the mean value for all of the, um, for the PM values, right? That's the information that you're obtaining from each one of them. So this would be PM1 for, because that's station one. Let's call it X1. PM1 is gonna be 20. And then this one is gonna be, PM2, it's going to be, let's say, 30. And then you aggregate them by time. If you do this for the mean of that same station across all of your weeks, and then you end up with something that would look like this. Um, so that if this is like the mean, the monthly, the mean over months of your PM values, then you would have here. Um, your, well, it depends on how you have it organized, but then you could have your latitude here and your longitude here. That long, and then you have here station one, station two, and then you have here your, your value or your PM10 value for that station. Well, no, those would be your coordinates. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That would be your coordinate for that station. I don't know what coordinate that would be, right? But that would be your um, Y value, your X value, specific information for that um, for that um, for that space station, and then you would have the value for your um, for the value the, the variable that you're working with. In this case, PM ten, so the particles in 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 the air that are less or higher than 10. I don't remember exactly how that is, how that goes. But then let's say your value is gonna be 20. So then that's what you're gonna end up with. And the way you represent that could be like this, or then you can and you can sort of switch those columns for the rows, however, in many different ways. But this is the most common way that I've seen it represented usually. And, and I, like I said, this is, um, aggregating the value of the particles of the uh, air particles from that month for all of your stations, right? So then that would be the sequence of monitoring stations or time intervals. Okay, let's clear all of this. Another example would be for these vector data cubes are demographic data consisting of counts, for example, with number of persons by regions for a sequence of n regions, H class, um, M H classes, 
year or different years, right? So then these would create an array of NMP elements where your first um, data frame would have uh, the, um, the population density or the number of people that are living in a region. Your second data frame in the array in the array would have the, um, the age classes, and the third one would have uh, for the years, right? So that that's the other way that it could uh, that could be represented there. Oh no, here. Um, so that would be when you have examples of vector data cubes, examples of changing dimensions. When you want to like uh, reduce and then not just work with all of the four dimensions that you were working with or ten dimensions that you had um, originally, then. You might be interested in changing those dimensions when you're dealing with, for example, interpolating air quality measurements to values on a regular grid, estimating number of flights passing by per week within a range of one kilometer, and the one that we were talking about, right? Like combining Earth observation data from different sensors, such as MODIS with Sentinel-2. Um, so then essentially you're seeing the same information from both because it's the same area, but this one has a different, so the MODIS data, which is, um, I think it's from the NASA, right? MODIS is NASA, right? MODIS imagery. Yeah, I think so. All of these are examples, for example, of data collected um, with the uh, moderate resolution imaging spectral radiometer, which is what MODIS, rep, uh, MODIS um, acronym represents. And let's see one. This is where you can see, for example, oh, wow, in June, wildfire in Scottish Highlands. So this is a very, for my understanding, it's a very remote area in, in, in Scotland, but anyway, so this is an example of, of, um, of one of those imageries, um, satellite imagery. And then what you have here is that MODIS has a resolution of 250 meter pixels, and then they collect it every 16 days, right? Every 16 days. And then when you have the imagery from Sentinel-2, then you have a resolution, a finer resolution because it's a 10 meter resolution. Uh, but it's collected every five days. So maybe you're interested in combining the information from these two satellites because you're interested in that, for example, heat focuses or um, uh, forest fires or something like that. So then you can, if you have the same, obviously the same area, then you can combine information from one and, or from two or three satellites that you're interested in. So that would be changing dimensions. The first one is an example when you are reducing dimensions, but this one is when you are actually augmenting dimension. Anyway, you can aggregate one or more dimensions when you are uh, dealing with, for example, air quality monitoring stations across time, you may be interested in seeing which region has the highest increase in disease, disease incidence across space and time. You may be interested in how temperature is fluctuating per decade. And then you are having, obviously, um, not just one, uh, one decade, but you are gonna have like 10,000 decades or something like that, right? Because obviously we're dealing with, with climate here. So then these are examples of, of things that you can do. This chapter doesn't really deal with how to do it because that's gonna come in, in, in future um, chapters, but this is more of things that you could do, right? Um, and just be aware that some of your, uh, some of the information that you, may that you may find in your rasters may be categorical, like for example, the, the one that I deal with you, um, more commonly is when I have um, not a value, but what I'm gonna have, well, it could be a value, but it represents a class. So it could be, for example, land cover classes. So if we see this 
land cover of raster. Let's see um, example. So what we have usually when we're dealing with uh, land cover classes is that you're going to have a raster of any area that you're interested in, but each one of the pixels doesn't represent a value, but it represents a class. So that class could be, for example, if that pixel is agriculture, um, is what is that portion of the land being used for? So is it water, for example, if it's a lake? Is it being used for agriculture? Is it being used for crops? Is it being used for um, cattle? Is it forest? So then that's the label that it's gonna have. So then you're not gonna be able to sum or estimate the mean value of that, right? There's a different way of dealing with categorical data that I'm sure we're gonna deal with in another one of the chapters, but just be careful thinking that you can sort of summarize anything that you see in a raster or in a cube because it's not really the case, right? There's another way of, of doing that. That would be, for example, estimating how many of those pixels, the proportion of pixels that have agriculture that are being um, used for agriculture, for example. And then what you do is you essentially count, well, not you, the R will do it for you, right? But you calculate um, how many of those rasters you have in your entire area are being used for agriculture or how many are being used for um, a forest or or something like that and you can you can there are ways of working with that right but not necessarily it's going to be like the mean of that variable because it's a categorical covariate right like you cannot do anything with that um and another way is that sometimes when what you're extracting from each one in this case from each one of your stations you're going to be dealing with in this case um concentration of if you have ozone here, for example, or sulfates or nitrates or uh, uh, the PM, which is the um, particles that are suspended in air. If you're dealing with things like this, for example, they are not necessarily going to be in the same uh, units. So it wouldn't mean it wouldn't make sense to sort of um, to sort of summarize them because you're not necessarily dealing with the same units. I hope that makes sense. So you can do that for one of them, yes, but not but not for all of them. Um, and I think that's it. That's the end of the chapter. Uh, the other things that don't match, that's the only thing that they say at the end of the chapter is that some data may not match the structure of a data cube, that's gonna be um, a set of spatial temporal coordinates of events or objects, for example, when you have accidents, and then that's gonna vary um, if you think of car accidents, for example, or disease cases, right? That's gonna vary spatially and temporally, but it's not necessarily across the same area. You're just obtaining the coordinates yes of each one of those events but because they are so random you're not necessarily dealing with um with them in the same way that you would have in a in a, in a cube or in a raster and the other um data that doesn't necessarily match the structure of a data cube is the trajectory data which is time sequences essentially when something is um is moving like think of um if you're dealing with cars, transportation, animals, or people that's moving across space or time, again, you're, for one, you can identify, like for example, if we're dealing with one um, Amazon car delivery. So you have that car, and then you have when it was 10 minutes from now, and then 20 minutes, and then 30 minutes. So you have the entire trajectory for one day, but that doesn't, and that's associated with that specific car or that, or that specific animal. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to, um, to match the structure that we saw with a, with a data cube. It's, that's a different structure. 
and ways of dealing with those types of data are completely different, right? There are ways to deal with that. And, um, and that's it. That's all I have for you today.